Welcome back to the channel. This is Chris Morrison, and I want to take just a few minutes and answer the question I have here. What is free grace theology? It's a position that I hold to, uh, and it is one that I at least reference quite a bit in several of my videos. So uh, whether you're new or to free grace or you're exploring it or you're just kind of, or maybe you don't believe it and you're kind of, what's it all about? I uh, just want to introduce that question to you here. And I would suggest that really the, 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 entrance into understanding free grace theology, the narrow way, if you will, is that it's just a particular take on the gospel. It's an affirmation. The gospel is very simple. So I've got four verses here. We could do literally over a hundred. I'm not going to read all these to you for time's sake. I'll take one, John 6, 47. I, I quote this all the time. Whoever believes in me has everlasting life. What I want you to note in all of these verses that I have here in red and green is there's a condition and then there's the result. And so the condition, all these simple belief, whoever believes in Jesus, that's the condition has everlasting life. In all the cases, believe and they're salvation. They're, they're saved. Believe or through faith, they have the righteousness of God. They're justified freely. It's really nothing more complicated than that. Belief equals uh, having eternal life period, end of story. And so we call that free grace. And in a sense, that's a little bit of a redundancy because grace by definition is free, but this is to emphasize that there's nothing we do to earn the gospel whatsoever. We simply receive it as a, as a free gift. Now, if that seems non-controversial, I would say to you, good, it should be non-controversial, but unfortunately, Many Christians will add conditions to the gospel, and sometimes they put it on the front end of the gospel, so you have to believe plus these things. Sometimes both on the back end of the gospel that after you believe, but then you have to do these things to keep or prove you have salvation. But uh, the point is, these are conditions that are often added. So for and this are this is not an exhaustive list. Things like uh, confession are added, repentance is often added, baptism is often added, final a perseverance and faith in good works is often added, or just straight good works themselves often added. Now, there are verses to defend all of these, and I have one sample verse for each one of them. We'll look at them here in just a moment. This is not to say that this is all the verses that they have. Uh, what you always need to do is read these verses and the many others, the proponents, these extra conditions suggest and read them in some detail. But let's just kind of go through some examples. So oftentimes with the confession is uh, an, a, a further requirement. It says that if you confess with him out Jesus, Lord, and believe, then you will be saved. Well, what I would say to that in response is, well, what exactly does Paul mean by saved here? People go, what do you mean? He just means go to heaven. Well, except for the fact the very next line says that with the heart, one believes resulting in righteousness and in Romans, righteousness is justification. And then with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. So Paul seems to be distinguished between salvation in some sense and right and being declared righteous in another. And I think in that section, he actually is. In general, one of the things that free grace theologians will point out is it's, it's become very apparent to us that salvation, the word salvation is used many more ways than to simply mean to go to heaven. So uh, confession may not be a part of the actual uh, gospel in terms of what to do to be saved uh, from hell. I uh, think about repentance, Acts 2 to 237 is very very common, 236, 237, 238, that whole passage where Peter says, repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And this is obvious. I mean, you have to repent. I mean, Jesus says, repent and believe the gospel. So this is one such verse. I would simply suggest that this actually does not contradict again or add conditions to. Uh, in the immediately preceding verse, it says that after he, they heard Peter's sermon, they were cut to the heart. So again, they felt something. Well, if someone says something you don't believe at all, then you're not going to be cut to the heart. It's not going to bother you because you don't believe it. They're asking these questions because they have believed on Jesus. They've believed that he's the Messiah. They believe they just murdered the Messiah. They've they've believed that truth now. And so what do we do with them now that they've just, I've killed Jesus and I he's my savior. What am I supposed to do? Well, the call here is to repent of that sin. And that's what it says, repent for the forgiveness of sins. And what's the result? Salvation from this crooked generation. And again, historically, we know that that generation was in fact wiped out, which I, in AD 70, I take that to be a judgment of God in large part because of the sin of murdering Jesus on the cross. Um, another one, baptism, Mark 16, 16, setting aside arguments whether or not that should be in the original manuscripts. Uh, this, they're one of many verses. Uh, Jesus says, whoever believes in is baptized is saved. So don't you have to be baptized? Well, two things. Number one, we can ask the question, what do we mean by saved once again? Is he talking about going to heaven? But second of all, notice that he's also simply, he doesn't say whoever disbelieves or does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned. He simply says, 
failing to believe is enough to condemn you. The condemnation comes in disbelieving. The salvation comes in believing. You should be baptized. Free grace theologians, we all teach you should be baptized because the Bible clearly teaches it. And I will say it's simply true. If you believe and you're baptized, you'll be saved. If you believe, you're also saved. If you believe and you're baptized, you're saved. And people should believe and, in fact, be baptized. Uh, another one is the person uh, you have to persevere. Jesus says, whoever perseveres till the end will be saved. I have that here in red. But if you look at the larger context of this passage, I don't think perseverance is an extra condition because it talks about how uh, this is a whole passage in the all of that discourse it's talking about how that at the end of the last days, they're going to deliver you up to oppression. You're going to be hated. They're going to stumble. False prophets are going to arise. The love many are going to grow cold, but the one who endures till the end will be saved. The end of what? The end of your life? No. The text immediately clarifies, and then the end will come. That's the end of time. So I take this as referring to the tribulation period Jesus had in mind. Jesus is not talking about going to heaven. And then finally, general good works. Uh, James 2.14, what good is of my brothers if a man says he has faith that has no works? Can faith save him? The answer is no, and be, that's the ex expected answer, and he goes on to argue that you have to have more than faith to save. And so then immediately this question raises between Paul and James. I have a whole video on this passage. I'll link it in the description below. Uh, but let me just kind of pause before we go into that, and I'm not going to go into here, but just in general, I recognize that people try to harmonize Paul and uh, the faith that faith alone saves, but faith that saves is never alone kind of stuff. But can I suggest much more generally, if you are actually suggesting that faith doesn't save, when Paul has clearly said faith saves, then perhaps there's a problem with your reading. And there is. Once again, salvation, we typically take this to refer to something other than going to heaven. And uh, that's, again, if you look, the word save occurs five times in the book of James and never in the other four times clearly does not refer to going to heaven. So it probably should not hear either. He's using the old Testament sense of being delivered from death or danger, which is what he's talking about there in James chapter two. So there are many confessions that people wrongly add. What I want to say is that uh, the simple idea is whoever believes in me has everlasting life. Think about the logic of this. Uh, imagine how I have it drawn out here. Think about this circle represents everyone who's believed they have faith, and this represents people who do all those other conditions, whatever your favorite condition is, be it baptism or repentance or perseverance, whatever. In the other views, what this would mean is that you have to have both faith and other conditions so that not everyone who believes has eternal life, but only people who are here in the middle who meet both conditions. Mo people say this is who were saved people who believe and are baptized or repent or confess or those sorts of things. That means only a subset of those who believe are saved. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says everyone who believes has eternal life. And that's what we believe is the gospel. To place your faith in Jesus is to be saved. So then what are the point of all those other conditions then? I mean, you're just saying they don't matter. You're just saying you live however you want. There are many, many, many reasons that we should confess, that we should persevere, we should do good works, we should be baptized, many, many things. I have a whole list. I'm not going to go through them one by one, but things like fellowship with God and blessing and wise living and meaningful relationships. Think of avoiding judgment, having effective prayer. How about just avo avoiding the sins of the flesh? If I, if I don't do the things God has told me to, I'm going to fall into the flesh and that's going to destroy my life. There are many, many reasons that I should live a Christian life and that I should repent and be baptized, all those other things. To tie those to heaven as if heaven is the only reason or having eternal life is the only reason, I think, is to confuse the starting line for the ending line. So again, free grace theology does not teach that you can just live however you want, live like the devil. It says there, it, it's a broader view. Yes, it's a simple gospel, but there are broader implications, as I hope you're starting to see a little bit. Uh, last couple of things uh, is that if we're going to say faith saves, I don't want to only think about receiving eternal life and going to heaven, even though I've talked a lot about uh, going to heaven in this particular video. One of the things that we recognize in the free grace uh, movement is that salvation is total and that it's the same faith that saves is going to be the same faith that sanctifies. So I think here in Galatians chapter three, verses one through six, where Paul is fussing at them for thinking that in some sense you have to a real Christian has to be under the law. And he asked this question, I want to learn this one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Here's your key. Having begun by the spirit, which is by faith, are you now being completed, sanctified by the flesh? That is by the law. Many Christians recognize them saved by faith, but then the ideas have to work really, really hard 
uh, after salvation to be a good Christian. Paul is saying here, no, you don't work really hard to be a good Christian. The same faith that freely saves you is the same faith you keep holding in Jesus and then watch him sanctify. You can no, be, you can no more be sanctified or completed by your good works than you could have been saved by your good works in the first place. Similarly, uh, Paul says again in 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, 23 through 24, the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus. He who calls you is faithful and he will do it. So notice that God is the one who does the sanctifying. He sanctifies all of you. And this is based on his faithfulness. It's not based on our commitment or our good works. So once again, when we say faith saves, we don't just mean that faith gets your eternal life and gets you to heaven. We mean that faith is the sufficient and necessary condition that gets you all, that you live the Christian life by and through faith and absolutely nothing else. A final issue that I want to touch on is the implications this has for your assurance of salvation. There are three general views, and we'll do some more videos on this later on assurance, but basically, how do you know that you're saved? There's one view that says the conditional security, the idea is that salvation can be lost. If I sin too much, if I lose my faith, then I'm saved or not, I'm going to go to hell. Uh, next view is called the final perseverance of the saints. Calvinists will tend to hold this is that I can't read or Baptists. They'll say that I can't actually lose my salvation, but if I don't continue uh, to the end, if I lose my faith or I don't know if good works, that just means I was never saved to be in with. The point is these two issues are practically speaking the same thing, because in both cases, if I lose my faith or I live too much in sin, I end up in hell. How they get there may be different, but it's the same position. The other one is eternal security, which is what we actually believe in. There is no sense in which salvation could be lost. The, call, the gifts of God are irrevocable. And why could they? God is the one who in my sin justified me. Not like God's going to say, I didn't know you were going to commit that sin, including the sin of unbelief. No, God chose to justify us freely. So there's nothing I can do to, to, uh, to take that back from him. And this, is, this is dependent, as we saw in Thessalonians, on God's faithfulness, not on mine. So once again, are you saying there's no reason to live a good life? Not saying that at all. We saw there are some benefits that God, and reasons that we're supposed to, nothing more in some ways than just obedience, because God said to live like his child. But those are things that are related to the rewards and, uh, and blessings, living things like that. They're not uh, related to actually having eternal life. So what then is the gospel? What is free grace? Again, I would just say it's the gospel. It's to believe that because Jesus died on the cross, rose for, uh, for all of your sins, rose from the dead, conquered your sins. Do you believe Jesus conquered your sins? Like truly, they're done. He won. He beat them. Your sins are no longer a concern to Jesus. So because he won, then he says that trust him. And when you trust him, he's the victor. Now, now just trust him every single day to do what he wants to do in your life. That is free grace theology in a nutshell. So I, I, I'm, I know this is a big topic. People uh, love it and some people hate it. We, we've been arguing about this literally since Galatians, one of the first books written in the New Testament. So do leave your questions, comments cries of outrage in the discussion below. We will continue this conversation with a series of future videos I have planned on um, a series on assurance. We're going to go into great detail on that. So make sure you subscribe to get uh, those, uh, make sure you get those updates. And if you have questions you'd like me to address in those videos, be sure to leave them and I'll, I'll do a quick comment there and I'll be sure to address them in the follow-up videos. In the meantime, may God richly bless you.